Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. <clears throat> Sorry. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Before we begin, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit our Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, feel free to use the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and the guest speakers will see them. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have any personal medical questions, please ask your doctor. Okay, Christine, would you like to pull up your slides? So next, in recognition of National Healthcare Decisions Day, which was April 16th, we have Panel of Nursing and Patient Care Services, Collaborative Governance, Ethics, and Clinical Practice Committee members, Brian Sear, Gail Alexander, Jessica Kaluschen, Christine Marmon, and they join us today to give a presentation on how to complete a Massachusetts healthcare proxy form. So please join me welcoming them. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. We're really happy to uh, be with you. So the purpose of our program today is to give you some brief background about advanced care planning for healthcare decisions, and then walk you through how to complete a Massachusetts healthcare proxy form. So this form legally names an agent to make healthcare decisions for you if you're ever in a situation when you are unable to make these medical decisions for yourself. So as Amy mentioned, my name is Brian Sear. I'm the nurse director on White 11 here at MGH. And in addition to this role, I also serve as the advisor to the um, MGH Patient Care Services Ethics and Clinical Practice Committee. And our committee um, works to educate, advise, and support clinical staff on ways to address ethical issues that can arise when we are caring for patients. Uh, the committee also serves as a resource to the wider MGH community, including patients and families, regarding the advanced care planning process. Our committee is made up of clinicians from many different departments, uh, including nursing, speech, language, and swallowing disorders, social service, medicine, physical, occupational, and respiratory therapy, interpreter services, and food and nutrition services. And for many years, one of our favorite annual events um, has been hosting the table in the white lobby in conjunction with National Healthcare Decisions Days uh, to talk about uh, advanced care planning. National Healthcare Decision Day was founded in uh, 2008 as a national movement to provide clear, concise, and consistent information on healthcare decision making to both public um, as well as healthcare facilities and share um, simple free uh, information to guide the process. And so traditionally, National Healthcare Decision Day is always held on April 16th, which is the day after tax day in a nod to the familiar adage that uh, nothing in, in life is certain except death and taxes. Um, so unfortunately, due to the pandemic this year, we weren't able to host our table but we've decided to take our message virtually. And so we're really happy to have you with us today. At the end of the presentation, we will share some of the resources available, uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be learning about the Massachusetts Healthcare Proxy Form and how to fill one out. Uh, as a reminder, as Amy mentioned, the Blum Center staff are available to you uh, for help accessing these resources, or if you have any other questions about the advanced care planning process after our presentation. So now I'm pleased to introduce three of my colleagues on the Ethical and Clinical Practice Committee who will take us through the presentation. We can start um, maybe with Jess. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica Kalustian. I'm a speech pathologist here at Mass General Hospital and I am one of the co-chairs of the Ethics and Clinical Practice Committee. And then I inter introduce Christine Marmon. Hi everyone, welcome. It's great to be with you today. I'm Christine Marmon. I'm a nurse at MGH. My background is in oncology and education and I am a co-chair of the Ethics and Clinical Practice Committee. And last but not least, uh, Gail Alexander. 
Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. My name is Gail Alexander, and I'm a nurse here at the hospital. Um, I am the patient education specialist in the Blum Patient Family Learning Center. And my clinical background is I've been an intensive care nurse uh, here in the hospital for many years um, in, my, in my clinical role. It's nice to see have you here. Thank you, guys. So um, Jessica's going to get us started now with our um, program. OK. So what is advanced care planning? Advanced care planning is basically deciding what your healthcare wishes are if you ever become too ill or too injured to make these medical decisions about your care on your own. And this is really a process. It involves planning for your future healthcare needs. And our thoughts about our, our healthcare needs are likely to change over time as we age and as we deal with various illnesses. So that means it's important for you to review your plan periodically and make sure that it still reflects your wishes. Part of advanced care planning can include filling out an advanced directive. Advanced directives are legal documents for adults ages 18 years of age and older. Advanced directives only go into effect if you are ever unable to make, uh, make decisions about your medical care, including your treatment preferences. The most common forms are the healthcare proxy and the living will. Today, we're specifically going to talk about the healthcare proxy form because this is the legally accepted form of advanced directive here in Massachusetts. So what is a healthcare proxy? Well, it's a simple legal form that you can fill out yourself. It tells your doctors who to talk to about your care when they can't talk with you. You pick a person you trust to make your healthcare decisions in the event that you are unable to do so. That person is called your healthcare agent. And you know, it may seem strange to start thinking about being seriously ill or injured. If this ever were to happen to you, ideally, you and your doctor would make decisions about your healthcare together. But what if you were unconscious or otherwise unable to express your wishes? Deciding today what your wishes are will help your doctor and your loved ones know what to do if that time ever became necessary. You have the right to make your wants and beliefs known. And even if you're in perfect health right now, it's not a bad idea to start thinking about what you would want your doctors to do in the event of a life-threatening situation. It's even more important to start thinking about this if you're older and already have some medical problems. So the healthcare proxy itself is a written form that names a person you trust as your healthcare agent. Again, this agent helps make your healthcare decisions if you are unable to make them yourself. It's very important that you choose a person who will agree to represent your wishes and to respect your values and beliefs, uh, even if they may be different from that, that person's values and beliefs. Um, so again, in Massachusetts, the healthcare proxy is the, is the legally recognized document of advanced directive. There are other names for this type of advanced directive that you may have heard before. So you may have heard of durable power of attorney for healthcare, uh, medical power of attorney, and appointment of healthcare agent. So who can be my agent? So your healthcare agent should be someone that you trust knows what's important to you and will represent your wishes even if they don't agree with you. And certainly someone who can make important decisions in tough situations. Your healthcare agent could be a spouse, a family member, or even a trusted friend. Um, actually, Christine, can you go back to the other slide? Thank you. So it's important to note that you choose your agent. And you'll see when we look at the form, the actual healthcare agent form a little bit later, there's uh, a spot for you to pick your primary healthcare agent as well as a backup agent um, in the event that your primary agent is ever uh, not available um, uh, when needed. Now, there are some people who actually cannot be your healthcare agent. For example, if you are a patient and, and living in a, a residential care facility, you can't pick someone who works at that facility unless they're related to you. I think, again, I think it's worth underscoring again, it's most important that your agent is someone whom you trust and whom you can share your values and wishes. 
So what should I talk about with my healthcare agent? Talk about what's important to you and what gives your life meaning. Be thinking about the kind of care you want, but also the type of care that you don't want. Tell them your medical preferences and the choices you might need to make in the future. Make your choices clear by writing them down in a personal directive. Although written personal directives or living wills are not legally binding in Massachusetts, they can still be very helpful to your healthcare agent uh, who can then use them as a guide to help represent your wishes. There are a couple of examples of some online tools that can help you write in a, uh, a personal directive. For example, Honoring Choices Massachusetts is one website that has a lot of information, as well as Five Wishes. How does the healthcare proxy work? Well, the healthcare proxy goes into effect when your doctor determines that you cannot make or communicate your own healthcare decision. Your healthcare agent then becomes a substitute decision maker who expresses your wishes when you're not able to. It's important to note here that a spouse or family member does not automatically have the legal authority to make decisions unless they are appointed by you to be your healthcare agent. If you don't have a healthcare agent and can't make or communicate your own decisions, the medical team will try to find a person who knows you best to represent you. Again, this is usually a spouse, an adult child, a sibling, or sometimes a close friend. In the event of an emergency, if a representative can't be contacted, the medical team will use their best judgment for you. However, for certain decisions, it may become necessary for your healthcare providers to seek guidance from the courts to appoint a legal guardian to represent your interests if you haven't already designated a healthcare agent. Another important point uh, I think to mention here is that naming a healthcare agent via a healthcare proxy does not automatically grant your healthcare agent. Um, sorry, I'm going to back up. It's important to know that naming a healthcare agent via the healthcare proxy grants them the, the authority to make medical decisions only if you are unable to do so. Many people think that as an agent, they can obtain sort of any and all information about a person. For example, um, let's say if you are in the hospital, the healthcare agent may call the floor that you're on uh, asking to receive information about you. So if you're not incapacitated and the healthcare proxy is not in effect, then healthcare providers still must receive permission from you to discuss any medical information, even if the person requesting that information is your healthcare agent. How does the healthcare proxy work? So you can give your agent full power to make any and all healthcare decisions or limited power by writing down some exceptions. If you regain your ability to make decisions, your agent no longer has the, the uh, power to make decisions for you. Next slide. Can I change my mind? Absolutely. You can change your mind at any time. Uh, in fact, a healthcare proxy is canceled if you fill out a new form, tell your agent or your doctor that you revoked or that you intend to revoke your proxy, or if you divorce or legally separate if your spouse is your agent. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Christine, who will actually kind of walk us through what this form looks like. Christine? Great, thank you, Jess. So for anyone um, that's following along that actually has a copy of the Massachusetts Healthcare Proxy form, you can follow along with the form. And if you don't have the form in front of you, we have it, um, we'll have it up on the screen. And we're actually, as I go through it, we're gonna share it piece by piece. So I'm gonna read it to you and then explain um, further. This is um, a copy of front and back of what the Massachusetts Healthcare Proxy Form looks like. Um, and we will go about it um, section by section. Okay, so at the top of the form, you'll notice that there's a space for the principal, which is the person who is completing the form to, comp to print their name or your name. We'll, we'll assume that it's you filling it out um, just for our purposes today. So print your name residing at, and you'll write your street, city, town, zip code, 
state zip code, um, appoint as my healthcare agent. And here's where you're gonna write the name of the person that you choose to be your agent. And then next, you're gonna write their address, their telephone number and their email. There's an optional section below that that says if my agent is unwilling or unable to serve, then I appoint as my alternate agent. And then here is a spot for you to be able to fill out um, name, address, and phone number of an alternate agent. Okay. Um, the next section says my agent shall have the authority to make all healthcare decisions for me. Sorry, I'm just gonna move something on my screen. Um, all healthcare decisions for me, including decisions about life-sustaining treatment subject to any limitations I state below. If I am unable to make healthcare decisions myself, sorry, I'm just moving something out of you, all right. My, um, if I'm unable to make healthcare decisions myself, my agent's authority becomes effective if my attending physician determines in writing that I lack the capacity to make or to communicate healthcare decisions. My agent is then to have the same authority to make healthcare decisions as I would if I had the capacity to make them, except, and then here's a spot where you can list limitations, if any, that you wish to place on your agent's authority. Okay, so here, if you want your agent to have full authority to act for you, leave the limitation space blank here. If you want to limit the kinds of decisions your agent or alternate agent can make for you, then you would insert them in, on this section of the form. However, setting limits on your healthcare agent's authority might make it difficult for your agent to act for you in a situation that you haven't anticipated. Therefore, rather than including specific instructions here on the proxy form, you may want to, want to provide your agent with flexible guidelines, and that's either through a discussion with your agent or by means of a separate document clearly labeled guidelines only. And in our experience, we really don't very often, if at all, see, see this part of the form completed. Um, next, it says, moving along on the form, I direct my agent to make healthcare decisions based on my agent's assessment of my personal wishes. If my personal wishes are unknown, my agent is to make healthcare decisions based on my agent's assessment of my best interests. Photocopies of this healthcare proxy shall have the same force and effect as the original and may be given to other healthcare providers. And this is where you would sign the form and date the form. Um, and if you'll see below it, it says complete only if principal is physically unable to sign. This is where if you're not able to sign um, for whatever reason, you can designate someone else to sign if you're not physically able. And um, it says, I have signed the principal's name above at his or her direction in the presence of the principal and two witnesses. So this is where if someone did need to sign on your behalf um, because you weren't physically able, they would then enter their name um, on this section of the form name and address. The next part of the healthcare proxy form is the witness statement. And this reads, we the undersigned each witness to the signing of this healthcare proxy by the principal or at the direction of the principal and state that the principal appears to be at least 18 years of age of sound mind and under no constraint or undue influence. Neither of us is named as the healthcare agent or alternate agent in this document in our presence on this day. So really the, um, the address, the, um, the date that is being signed under the witness statement 
should match the date under the principal statement because really all of this needs to be done um, you, when you're completing your healthcare proxy form and you're signing it and dating it, it needs to be done in front of two witnesses. So the witness statement would then match the date, um, the same date that you had just completed. And then there's a spot underneath for each witness, witness one and witness two, to fill in their signature, their name and their address. Um, before you sign, you're gonna make sure you have two adults present who will each witness and watch you sign the document. And the only people who can't serve as witnesses are your agent and alternate agent. Um, and then you'll sign and date the document yourself um, as well as your agents. So what we're looking at here is the revert backside of the healthcare proxy form. And this, um, this section is optional. However, we highly um, recommend um, completing it and I'll explain why in a minute. So there's a section here for the healthcare agent and alternate agent to each sign this acknowledgement. And I'll read, I'll read what it says to you. I have been named by the principal as the principal's healthcare agent by this healthcare proxy. I have read this document carefully and have personally discussed with the principal his or her health wishes at the time of possible incapacity. I know the principal and I accept this appointment freely. I am not an operator, administrator, or employee of a hospital, clinic, nursing home, rest home, soldier's home, or other health facility where the principal is presently a patient or resident or has applied for admission. But if I am a person so described, I am also related to the principal by blood, marriage, or adoption. If called upon and to the best of my ability, I will try to carry out the principal's wishes. And this is where your healthcare agent would sign. Um, the verbiage right below it for an alternate agent reads exactly the same. Um, so even though it's optional, so on the back of the form, the statements that I just read to you, um, they're not required by law, but it is recommended to ensure that you have talked with the person or persons who may, be, who may have to make important decisions about your care. Um, and that each of them realizes the importance of what this means. So really that's what this, these statements are an acknowledgement of. And we've had experiences where we've contacted a patient's healthcare agent and they did not know that the patient had named them as agent, which, which certainly makes for a challenging situation. So this section is a nice way to make sure you let your agent know you have named them. And really most importantly, you've had the opportunity to discuss what is important to you regarding healthcare decisions. So I think a theme that you'll hear us hopefully continue to reinforce is really, it's so important to have the conversation with the people who will be in a position to make decisions for you so that those in, uh, decisions are really informed by your wishes. So who should have original copies? So once you complete um, the healthcare proxy form, you'll retain the original form, you'll keep it. And we recommend that you keep it in a place in your home that's easy to find. So that's gonna be different for all of us. Some people may put it in a file cabinet that's clearly marked or labeled or in a folder that is in a well-traveled area of their home that it would be easy for somebody to locate. Um, maybe a refrigerator. Um, so what, whatever spot in your home is easiest to find is a good place for you. So that's your original copy. You wanna make sure that you give copies to your healthcare agent, photocopy to your healthcare agent, your alternate healthcare agent, doctor, nurse practitioner, whoever um, coordinates your care. And then also maybe a clergy member or a lawyer, if they may at some point be involved in your healthcare decision-making. So once you've completed Massachusetts healthcare proxy form and you've signed it and dated it, your witnesses have done the same, that is an active legal form. So 
um, any of the following four things will cancel your healthcare proxy. So if at any point you sign another healthcare proxy form afterward, the most recent healthcare proxy form will be the active form and it will cancel your, your, the one you had filled out previously. And this definitely, this definitely happens a lot. Things can change over time and you may change your wishes about who um, will make decisions on your behalf. So it's perfectly fine to complete a new form as things change. If you legally separate or, div uh, or divorce from your healthcare agent, that will cancel your prior healthcare proxy. If you notify your agent or healthcare provider orally or in writing that you want to cancel it, that would cancel your prior healthcare proxy form. If you do anything else that clearly shows that you want to cancel it, like tearing up the form, crossing it out, or telling other people, that would cancel it as well. For any of those situations where you say verbally that you want to cancel it or you tear up the form, um, anything like that, or, or it becomes invalid for one of the other reasons we discussed, we really recommend that you make a decision about who you'd like to be uh, named as your new healthcare agent and alternate agent and complete a form um, as soon as possible that is also witnessed and signed by witnesses. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kel, who's gonna share with you some resources. Thank you, Christine. Um, so one of the nice things about the Maxwell and Elena Blum Patient and Family Learning Center is it's a great health information resource for all of you that you probably already know about. And by contacting them, they can um, direct you to getting a Massachusetts healthcare proxy form either um, through an electronic resource or could mail you one to your home if you desire. So in addition to obtaining a forum, obtaining um, other resources about advanced care planning, it's a great place to um, send an inquiry. Another one that um, as we prepared for this presentation that just had a, a really nice um, getting started toolkit was Honoring Choices Massachusetts. And you can just search for that and it will bring you to a site where it, um, the toolkit has step-by-step -step instructions on filling out a healthcare proxy form, similar to what we just did in our presentation, but also really a lot of information about being thoughtful about choosing an agent, and completing a personal directive. So a personal directive is really a personal statement that is not necessarily legally binding, but it does provide written information about what's important to you and may be really helpful to um, your agent or the person that might need to make decisions if you can't make them yourself. And all of these sites, the next, the next two included, really are um, great resources for thinking about those kinds of um, um, values and thoughts and wishes that you might have with some um, probing questions or some tools or toolkits and also about how, how to have the conversation perhaps with your agent or your family members. And that is the conversation project. So that is the third bullet point on this list. That is a, an organization that um, provides free conversation guides. It can help you have the conversation with important people in, in your life about your or their wishes um, for your care if you can't make decisions on your own. So that particular website will direct you to the Mass Medical Society to obtain a healthcare proxy form. It also has information about National Healthcare Decisions Day, which we talked about in our introduction. And finally, Five Wishes is another organization that has a complete approach to discussing and documenting your care and comfort choices. Um, it's really about connecting families, communicating with healthcare providers, and showing your community what it means to care for one another. So they provide tools 
Um, the Five Wishes booklet has a proxy form integrated right into it that meets the Massachusetts legal standards, but it has a lot more than that. Again, in that tool guiding you through some choices and some options and, and thinking about what you might want. Um, that organization also provides online um, the ability to get some uh, booklets to help adolescents and children, particularly those that have some kind of life limiting illness um, to guide them with an adult through a similar process in terms of helping them identify what is important to them. So those are three um, um, organizations that we found their materials might be very helpful. And again, the Blum um, Patient Family Learning Center can also help you access those or other forms if, if you like. So the last slide. So this is kind of a powerful thing to think about where it always seems too early until it's too late. Um, we recommend that anybody, any adult, healthy, um, robust, not thinking about being incapacitated in any way, anybody over the age of 18 should really have a healthcare proxy form because we don't really know um, what the day may bring. And if we were in a position where we could not make decisions for ourselves, we wanna make sure that we have um, filled out a form, appointed an agent and had a conversation with that agent um, about what's important to us and what we would want. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. Um, we certainly have time uh, to answer any questions if any have come through the chat, but um, I think we all wanna thank you for your attention and uh, thank Amy for helping us uh, do a Zoom conference um, presentation like this before. This is new for me anyway, and I've done a lot of presentations. So um, thank you, Amy, and thank you, everybody that listened. Thank you, Gail. So now we are reaching toward the end of our session. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, feel free to enter them in the chat box. So we have a couple of questions, one being, is the healthcare proxy available in other languages other than English? Yes, the healthcare proxy is, is available in many different languages. Um, if you would like to get a copy in a language other than English, absolutely contact the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center. They have access to them um, and can get one to you. It's, it's a great question, thank you. And then what if, a person is not a Massachusetts resident, for instance, lives in New Hampshire, but receives care at Mass General Hospital, what healthcare proxy should they be filling out? We recommend that you perhaps fill out two. So you would fill out one for Massachusetts and then there'd be a form specific to New Hampshire that would look very similar to this form likely. All 50 states have some iteration of the form. And, um, you know, if, if you didn't have one filled out, if you had a, Mass, a, a New Hampshire um, form and something happened and you didn't have a Massachusetts healthcare proxy form, it's not that we wouldn't reach out to your agent and um, certainly appreciate the input into your care. Uh, it just, um, it, it ends up being challenging in very rare circumstances, um, often in terms of like somebody who has a, a pretty significant um, illness that requires like long-term placement, but for other medical decisions, it, it'd probably be sufficient, but it, it's best to, if you're getting care in, in Massachusetts, to have a Mass, Massachusetts healthcare form, as well as in the state that you reside. Okay. Can I have healthcare co-agents equally together? So it, no, I guess is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's the primary agent that you identify is who the healthcare team would look for for direction. Um, and so it would be important for you to have the conversation with that person that it's important to you that they consult with, you know, said it's, if you have two, two, or two children, for example, um, and you name one of the children as your primary and one as the alternate, that you we would say have a conversation with both of them together and say, I'm, you know, I'm naming 
Bill as my primary agent and Karen as my secondary agent. And But it's really important for both of you to know that these are my wishes um, and that if either of you are called on to act upon that, this is what is important to me. Because the point to remember is it's it's not, um, the agent is, is speaking for you, not for themselves. Um, and so just making sure that it's clear to whoever you appoint, primary or secondary, what your wishes and values are and what decisions you'd, you know, if there are specific things that you do or absolutely don't want, that that's clear to them. Should the healthcare agent live in the US? It's not a requirement. The, um, the challenge is just trying to get in touch with somebody if, um, if there are decisions that need to be made. And so it, it doesn't, it, that's less of an issue in, a, in this world that we live in now that's so, um, so connected. Um, and so the principles are the same, that it would be somebody that you trust and that you have a, a relationship with. The other thing, I guess, you know, depending on what the relationship with that person was, it's not necessarily a one-time conversation as you, um, you know, especially if you have a, a chronic illness that is progressive over time, that your wishes may change over time. And so making sure that you're sort of have that type of relationship with this person. Um, and that's not to say that you couldn't if they weren't living in the country. It's just mostly that we'd have um, good, inf good, good way to contact them. So adding multiple phone numbers or emails, you know, would pr probably be helpful. Mm -hmm. And can undocumented immigrants fill out the healthcare proxy form? Yes, and there's the form isn't um, filed with the courts like on the initial um, time that you complete it. You hold on to the form, and it's legal and at that time if it's witnessed and dated properly. And um, so, if there was concern about, I, I don't know enough to speak about some of the concerns that may arise, but to know, to know that piece, the only time that the court gets involved is if um, the, a, a person who completed a healthcare proxy form was deemed to not have the capacity to make a specific medical decision, but was able to verbalize what they didn't want. So like often we see this some in patients with dementia who may be very adamant that they um, you know, don't wanna to go to rehab after a hospitalization. And yet it's really unsafe for them to go home. And the family who takes care of them at home um, also doesn't think it's safe for them to come home. And so while the person is able to verbalize that they don't wanna to go to rehab, they aren't really able to process and express the risks of going home um, you know, and and also acknowledge that the the people who take care of them at home aren't aren't able to do that for them. And so, if there if there was some disagreement about um, about that, we would have to go to court to invoke the proxy, which would basically um, the court would determine that the person really doesn't have the capacity to make this decision before we. Um, before we sought the input of the agent versus in a situation where say somebody was, you know, in a more black and white situation where somebody's in a coma and is just unable to speak that it's not necessary to go to court to invoke the agent. Okay. If a person completed a healthcare proxy form over 10 years ago, is that still legally binding, still valid? Unless there's any, um, any of the things that Christine talked about that would make it invalid. They're good indefinitely. I'll give it another minute to see if anyone else has any questions. In the meantime, do you have any thoughts you all like to share with the audience? One thing that's come up, you know, um, Christine shared that if you get divorced or legally separated, that uh, and you had named your um, former spouse as your agent, that the form becomes invalid. But there are situations where somebody may want their ex, ex wife or ex husband to serve as their agent despite the, um, the end of their marriage. And so you, it's recommended that you complete a new form um, dated after the, um, the date of the um, finalization of the dissolution of the marriage. And, um, and probably, you know, 
uh, attach some sort of statement to the form that says I willingly appointing my ex spouse to serve as my agent. Mm -hmm. What if a patient receives care at different hospitals within the Mass General Brigham system? Do they need to complete and submit one healthcare proxy form or is it valid across the Mass General Brigham system? Yeah, it's valid across not just Mass General, but across healthcare institutions in the state. And um, it's one of the great advantages of Epic, which is the, you know, I, I um, it's the whole, um, when, when uh, electronic medical records were coming out, it, this was the promise that they offered and it's being fulfilled, is that um, if you bring your healthcare proxy to your um, physician or your NP or your doctor's office, or if you're admitted to the hospital and you bring a copy or complete a new form while you're admitted to the hospital, it gets scanned into your electronic record in Epic and um, is visible to anybody um, who would need that access to that information while you were hospitalized at Mass General, but that Epic also communicates across um, hospitals. And so um, it's, it's accessible. And it, we've had ex circumstances where a person has come in and has not been able to make medical decisions for themselves. And before um, the, we would try to find the healthcare proxy. Um, so the family may think there's one completed and somebody had a PCP who was in you know, the Leahy system or something, we would reach, could reach out to their office to see if they have a copy. So it's, it's not specific to the hospital. Okay, so as long as the hospital uses Epic as their electronic medical record system, they should have access to that. Yes, but I mean, if you have a, that's why we encourage you to give copies to your, um, to your agent so that it, it's nice that you have the copy, but if you're incapacitated, you won't be able to tell anybody where it is. So it's important that you, your agent has the copy or multiple copies, frankly, um, and is able to bring it into the hospital if it's needed. More recently with the increase in virtual visits, if someone wants to complete a healthcare proxy form today and don't have an in-office visit scheduled anytime soon, how can they submit their healthcare proxy form? I defer to the, um, to the practices, but I would imagine that there, there's a fax number if people still, I don't know that people still have faxes, but if you were <laughs> able to um, take a picture of this on your phone and email it um, securely to your, the practice that they would be able to then get it sent to medical records and have it scanned into your record. I think the logistics of that might be different from practice to practice. Um, so okay. if that's a, a significant concern, uh, I would discuss with your, um, with your practice and they'd be able to guide you. And the important thing would be if a person's filling it out, just to make sure that they do have their two witnesses with them, um, witnessing them completing the form um, as well. So that, that part of it would remain the same. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not, it's, 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 um, it's been very helpful to have the document scanned into the medical record here. It's more critical that your agent has that and and um, and would presumably know you were in the hospital and then be able to provide that if necessary. Sure. But it's very helpful to have it scanned into the record. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll give another second, but I think that's all the questions that we have today. All right, so Brian, Christine, Jessica, Gail, Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Very helpful. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. As I'd mentioned, today's session is being recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit our Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. I would give it about a couple of weeks for it to be posted, but it will eventually be there. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks for thank joining you, us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.